My name is Vlad. I'm a .NET Automation Tech Lead at Cyclum. I have over eight years of professional experience in IT. What's interesting is that I work both as a developer, .NET developer for three years and for five years, and actually a bit more. I worked as a QA automation engineer, so I have perspective from both sides and I found it very helpful in my practice. So I, I w I'm willing to share my experience with you and teach you what, I, what I've learned through all these years. I've been working for more than three years with Cyclone. Um, Olin already said a few words about Cyclone. I would just add that uh, in Cyclone we have very like, regular knowledge sharing sessions. We also do uh, public ones as this one, but if you join Cyclone, we also have a lot of spaces and a lot of internal events. So one of our main ideas is knowledge sharing and improving your professional skills. So if you'd like to see more presentations similar to this one and get in more knowledge. So I highly recommend because we have a very good uh, knowledge community in Cyclone. And also I'm a regular speaker in such knowledge sharing events. I also uh, had the chance to speak at some conferences. I try to focus mainly, mainly on teaching best practices in test automation in .NET. And one of this, uh, today we're gonna look at spec flow, how you can master spec flow in .NET. And uh, so the agenda for today, we're going to start from a more high level view. So we're going to start discussing what is BDD, behavior driven development, when to use it, uh, when, uh, when you should try to apply it in your project, what are the benefits and down, uh, downsides. Then uh, with each uh, section, we're going to get more and more technical. Then we're going to talk about best practices in spec flow. And in the third part of our talk, we're going to dive even deeper into more technical details and discuss some advanced concepts in spec flow, which will be useful, will be useful for your project. Uh, and the presentation should take, as Elena said, about 40 minutes to an hour. And then at the end, we're going to have a session for questions. And uh, just to say from my side that if I'm not able to answer a question live due to some reasons, such as lack of time, or I'm not familiar with your question, don't worry, I'm going to cover and res going to respond to them and send them to you later. So you, you'll be able to get the answers to all of your questions. So please put them in the chat during the presentation and then in the end, I'm going to try to reply to them all. So let us begin. Let's start with the overall bird's eye view of behavior dri driven development and ask ourselves question, why BDD at all? So uh, what is the point of BDD? So BDD or behavior driven development, it's a, a framework for improved collaboration between developers and stakeholders. It aims to improve this communication and it also functions as a kind of living documentation. So what is the difference? Uh, this is the kind of documentation which is, uh, can be executable. And in the report, you can see exactly what failed, what kind of functionalities are working or not. And this differs from usual static documentation, which is updated manually and it is written by people and it has no actual connection to your code base. And that is the big difference with behavior driven development. Also, it's important to mention that it integrates very well with the agile framework, uh, especially if you work with scrum and you work on user stories, then it's very easy to, uh, if you write acceptance criteria for your user stories, uh, in a BDD format, actually in Gherkin format, so given when then human readable format, then it's a very easy to integrate BDD into your process and convert this acceptance criteria into actual executable uh, tests, and they also function as a li uh, living documentation. Also to implement BDD properly, you need um, to have a user-centric development approach. That means that you approach your development and your requirements and documentation from the point of view of the user. And I'm going to show you uh, several examples later, which will clarify this point. But also the most important thing you should also realize it, it's not just about testing. So a common misconception I see is that people think that if you just uh, write your tests in Gherkin given when then format, that means that you're doing BDD. It's a very big misconception. So to get the most uh, value and benefit from BDD, you have to change your whole philosophy and process. And you have to change and adjust your um, process to actually make it work. And I'll give you an example of what I mean. So for order, in order for BDD to work, you need to involve your stakeholders. That is the main benefit. So um, it's not only that it is your choice that you write tests, either code or in this uh, Gherkin syntax. It means that you change your whole development process. 
and stakeholders need to be involved and they have to actually review and take a look at, at, at your test cases. Then it actually makes sense. So I can give you an example from my projects, how it currently looks like. We're using SpecFlow and we're doing test automation for microservice architecture. So when uh, our business analysts create in a story, uh, they are actually um, acceptance criteria for the story and are written in the Gherkin syntax, which will then convert into test cases in SpecFlow. But uh, it doesn't just end there. So after we implement those test cases, we demo them to our stakeholders, which are able to understand what the tests are doing because they're written in human readable format. Then they are integrated with our test management software, and then our stakeholders can actually check uh, check the supports from SpecFlow. They can see this living documentation, and they can see what functionalities are working for given release what have failed, what we have covered in the sprint, etc. So to reiterate this point, uh, if you really want to use BDD in your project, you have to involve your stakeholders and it has to be a part of your normal everyday process. So it's not just about testing. Uh, this is an example of Gherkin syntax. Gherkin syntax. So uh, BDD tests are written uh, usually in similar human readable format. So SpecFlow also uses Gherkin syntax and it's very basic. Uh, so you have three parts. You have given part, when part, and then part. If you're familiar with unit testing, especially if you're a developer, there's a very common pattern which is discussed, arrange, act, assert. So this is pretty much the same, but it is uh, written in human readable uh, language. So this is the arrange part. So in the given part, you define any preconditions for your test case, which you need. So in our example, we expect that the user is navigated to a reset password page. This is our act step. So when step, uh, this is the action which uh, the user does. So in this case, this will be the when the user enters their email address and confirms. And then we have our verification step, which is a then step. And then we actually do our assertions and check what we want to check. So this is a basic structure of Gherkin syntax. And the more we move in our presentation, I'll show you even more complex examples and how you can use them in your project. Uh, before we move to that, uh, it's also worth noting that um, cases where using BDD doesn't make much sense. So as with every technology, it has to solve uh, some problems or has to improve uh, your work life or your project. So it doesn't mean even if it's very useful, it doesn't mean that it works for you. So the cases where you probably shouldn't use BDD is, uh, first of all, these are simple or short-lived projects. So the projects where it just doesn't make the sense to introduce this overhead uh, because the project is very simple or very short-lived, so it's easier to just write tests in a normal way. Also, a very important point is if you have a lack of stakeholders' involvement into the development process, then also it doesn't make sense because, as we remember from the previous slide, it's not just about testing. So if the stakeholders are not going to participate in this process, you may well be better off not using BDD. Of course, it's case by case basis, but I think that lack of stakeholders is crucial. Uh, of course, if you're liking it now, but uh, you want to get them involved, it's possible too. But you have to keep in mind that this is something you have to do or something which already has to be in your project to make BDD work. Also, another case where BDD doesn't make sense is that uh, a lack of clear requirements. This is usually, again, small or startup projects. They are very virtuoso projects. People doing things on the fly. There are no clear requirements. People are experimenting constantly, et cetera, et cetera. So also probably for such projects, it doesn't make much sense. And the last point is a very late phase of the project. Uh, let's say, let's say it's, the project is coming to the later phases. And if you want to introduce BDD at that point, it would cost too much overhead or refactoring. So. You also need to consider what stage your project is in and if it is a very late phase and the project will end soon, maybe all this effort of introducing BDD doesn't make much sense. But uh, what is a not a valid reason to dismiss BDD? Uh, unfortunately, I hear it very often and uh, more times than I would want to. Uh, that Sometimes I hear that test automation engineers are saying that BDD doesn't make sense just because it's uh, hard to maintain or it's a pointless trend or they don't, don't want to use it. So this is not a valid reason at all. And most of the time it's either prejudice, uh, laziness, resistance to change, or simple unaware, unawareness. And unfortunately, as I've said, this reaction is quite common. So if you're considering BDD for your project, uh, I would um, recommend uh, not to take this into account because people are usually just resistant to change. So you need to evaluate all the things we mentioned before.
and determine whether it, it will be useful for your project or not. Uh, a few words about SpecFlow before we jump into technical details. So SpecFlow is a leading uh, BDD framework for .NET. It is completely free and open source, so you don't have to get a license for it. You can use it in every project, both commercial and private projects. A huge benefit of SpecFlow is that it integrates with most of the popular unit testing frameworks, for example, NUnit, XUnit, MS-Test. So if you already have a test automation framework built on these uh, test runners, then you don't have to change anything because it was made to integrate well with your process. But if you uh, are not using existing test runners and you would like to start from scratch or you want to try a different runner which has more functionalities uh, and works uh, better with SpecFlow, you can try SpecFlow Plus Runner. They also provide their own test runner, but it's not required. And actually, in my experience, I never used it and uh, I've been using it with existing uh, test frameworks such as NUnit and XUnit and it works perfectly well. And uh, SpecFlow frameworks allows uh, to easily map this given when then working syntax into step definition methods in C sharp, where you actually provide your code and the logic for your test. Uh, so an example of a spec flow step and a step definition would be as follows. So let's say we have a spec flow step when the user logs in using Google authentication. Uh, spec flow allows you to create step definitions using regular expressions. It is very flexible. You can provide parameters. Uh, you can provide multiple parameters, like more complex regular expressions, but basically it allows you to map a step written in a human readable format to a C-sharp code where you actually can do your logic. In this case, we, uh, we have a login logic and here we have our C-sharp code. So these are the basics of spec flow and let's move on to actually a bit deeper and let's discuss the best practices in SpecFlow, which I've observed, and actually most of them are recommended by SpecFlow itself. So first, first thing you should do is uh, when writing tests using SpecFlow and BDD in general, uh, you should use a third-person view to describe your scenarios. Uh, what I mean by that, um, this is a first. Uh, this is an example of incorrect, incorrectly written SpecFlow test, and it uses a first-person view, so it doesn't follow this practice. And first person view is you try to describe the behavior like from your own perspective as, as I, as a person. So for example, given I am on a reset password page, when I provide the email address, then I see a confirmation message. So first of all, who is I? Is it the tester who wrote the test? Is it the person who reads the test? Is it a stakeholder? It doesn't, uh, we don't know. That's why this format is confusing. And also remember that we discussed previously a user-centric approach. So you need to think from a perspective of a user. So in the, in the correct scenario, you need to say what the user should do. So you shouldn't use I, you should use actually the third person view. This makes tests much easier to understand because uh, you don't rely on I, which is unclear who it is. It can be given a user, the customer, specific user, if like your uh, system supports different users. But basically, you should try to think from a user perspective and write your steps accordingly. So this is the first thing I would like to share is using the third person view. Uh, next thing, uh, a common mistake I see when people try to uh, write tests in spec flow, uh, especially if they have experience writing tests in code, uh, they try to move the same philosophy from coding uh, to BDD, which doesn't work. So they try to describe every, every step very technically and they provide too much details so basically instead of writing uh, proper business steps they write a kind of pseudo code which is then converted into code but of course this doesn't approach uh, this approach doesn't make any sense and if you're gonna do it like that then i'm, I'm not surprised that people say that spec flow uh, doesn't bring much value or it's hard to maintain because as we discussed, you need to change your philosophy a bit and you need to think more from a business perspective and from a user perspective. So imagine that the stakeholder is reading this test. He doesn't care like how exactly you navigate to the reset password page, what exact buttons you click, etc. He just wants to see that, uh, for example, the reset functionality is working and we have our expected business rules implemented as a test. And another part, if you write your spec flow test like this with too many detail, imagine that something in the flow of your application changes. So now instead, in order to get to 
a page which you want, you need to do a bit of different steps. And if you write everything in spec flow like this, on every change, you would have a maintenance nightmare because you would have to go back and basically change every spec flow test and change the flow or change something. And if you do it properly and you actually use declarative syntax of business language and you actually describe business functionality, not the exact steps the user needs to do technically, then even if something is changed, for example, uh, to nav in navigation to this page, you would change it in the behind code, uh, which is responsible for this step, and you wouldn't have to go back and every time change your tests. So this is another huge uh, benefit for your maintenance. Not only it makes your tests much easier to read and understand for non-technical people, and they convey the purpose of your test much more clearly, also you will have much easier time, much, much easier time maintaining your tests later. So. This is why it's important to uh, use more of a business language or declarative syntax. Of course, uh, you in practice, you will find the golden middle because sometimes it's uh, it's a mix of both, but you should always lean into this direction if you want uh, to get the most of uh, BDD and SpecFlow in general. Another point I would like to share is that you should aim for usability uh, by using parameterized steps. So just like in code, uh, you should think also to make your tests reusable. So instead of defining a new step uh, for each, um, for example, let's say you have different login methods, you have different products which you can add. So here we have a scenario for successful checkout with a credit card. You also can have a scenario for successful checkout, for example, with a different type of pay payment, such as loyalty points payment. And in this case, what I would recommend, uh, SpecFlow pro provides parameters and instead of defining a separate step definition for each action, you can actually provide parameterized variables. For example, you can have the same step responsible for login, but it will work with both Google authentication, Apple authentication, and the same, for example, for this uh, step for adding a product, you can add different products, et cetera, et cetera. So you should think about that while you implement your tests, and it will also lead to much better maintenance. But not only that, uh, even a better approach in such cases when you have very similar scenarios but with different data, you could use something called scenario outline. And this is uh, supported by spec SpecFlow out of the box. And this allows you uh, to have a kind of a template of your test. So if your test does similar things, but you can provide different data as examples. So if you're familiar with unit testing, this would be a providing test case source or test data attribute. And in this example, we just changed these two tests which we had before, and we can combine them into one, and we can provide these parameters. So one test will run uh, using Apple authentication, we'll add a Samsung product, uh, Samsung TV product, and we'll pay with loyalty points. And then another test will uh, use a different authentication method, add a Sony TV product, and use a different payment type. So this allows you to save uh, your space and to combine several tests into one. And actually it's still very readable because uh, the user can see what exactly we're testing and uh, what test data are we using. Next uh, recommendation is to never chain scenarios together. This is not only related to spec flow, but it's related to testing in general, but I feel like I should mention it because the same mistake can be repeated in spec flow as well. What does it mean? It means that each scenario have to be, has to be independently executable from other scenarios. You should never uh, let one test depend on another test. There are multiple reasons for that. Reproducibility, maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it introduces a lot of problems if you have that. So the best practice is to isolate your tests. And if you need to do, for example, common things for a group of tests, such as setup or cleanup, uh, you can use spec flow hooks, which we'll cover in the next chapter when we'll go into more detail. But to provide you an example, uh, this is an example of chaining, which unfortunately I still sometimes see in practice. So what a person tries to do, he usually logics works like this. So we have, we'll start first by creating one test, let's say create an order. So but then we have another uh, business requirement that the user should be able to cancel the order. So what people unfortunately commonly do, they think, okay, I already have a test which creates an order. So why not use that and like run it first? And then I will just cancel it, uh, the same order and run like the cancel order scenario as a next test. Uh, this brings a lot of problems. First of all, uh, if you run them both, they will pass 
But if you want to check just the cancel order functionality, if you don't run this before, the test is going to fail. So test is not self-contained and it's very confusing. Each test should be run by itself and it should pass if the functionality is working. So this adds confusion. And also it ends, uh, as you know, from coding, introducing tight coupling and dependencies introduces a lot of problems in maintenance later. So I would also always recommend to properly isolate your test. And let's say if we have this again example, uh, we have a cancel order scenario and we before we run it, we need to have an existing order which we can cancel. Then you can use a spec flow hook and set up an order uh, in the hook itself. And then uh, the test itself will just operate on that order. And this will make sure that even if you don't run a create order test before, if you run just this test, it's still going to pass and it's going to be much easier to maintain because it uses only data for this test. So no other test can change this data. So this is common sense for all testing, but uh, I sh feel I should all, I should have mentioned for spec flow as well. And uh, some more tips to properly isolate your scenarios. Uh, so to help you with that, uh, I would recommend not to reuse existing entities, for example, products or users or customers. You should always create unique set of data for each test, uh, for spec flow test as well. Uh, if your tests rely on some kind of configuration, let's say in database or whatever, you can inject it at runtime before or after the test. And you should also clean up your data, as for example, databases, leftover files, etc., because it also helps uh, to make sure that there are no lef leftover data from other tests which will interfere with the current test. So if you follow such simple guidelines, you will make sure that your test base is much, much easier to maintain. And to give you an example, um, so this is pseudocode. It will not work in spec flow. I just uh, wanted to show you uh, what we can do in the hook. This is the actual uh, spec flow test. So to show you a properly isolated example of a test, so let's say we have a scenario where we want to navigate to a shopping cart, add a product and check out an order. So uh, what people commonly do, they start using existing products, existing usernames, existing products. And what happens then is that other tests can change it, or let's say even a manual tester can go on the environment and like mess with the application and change the product which your test uses. So this causes a lot of instability. Your tests are then not reliable. So to implement those advices, which we saw in the previous slide, so what we can do then, first we should create a unique user for our test. We should create a unique product as well. So in this case, we're gonna create a user and product. By using spec flow hooks, we can set up the user and the product before the test. And if you noticed in this test, we would like to pay with loyalty points. And another thing which can happen is that uh, if you don't inject configuration, let's say someone can disable loyalty points payment for the system before you run the test, either manually or some other test. So you need to make sure that before this test, it's actually available. So steps we can take, create a user, create a product. Also, we need to create a user with collect correct loyalty points balance so he can pay, uh, correct products with correct price, and we enable loyalty points payment. And then we just provide this as parameters to our spec flow test. And then we, after scenario, we just do a cleanup. So as we mentioned before, we should clean up our data to make sure that it doesn't interfere with any further tests. So the aim of this is to show you an example. Of course, uh, there are different ways to do this, but this is uh, like one I would recommend. And after, let's move on to the some more advanced spec flow concepts, the juice. It will get uh, even a bit more technical and uh, we're, we're gonna see much more code, but bear with me if you'll have any questions. Again, I would like to remind you to write them in the chat and I'll try to address them at the end of the talk. So hooks, uh, we've already talked a bit about them. Uh, so hooks are basically a mechanism uh, which is provided by spec flow and it allows you to perform additional automation logic, uh, for example, at different types, a different time of execution. Uh, for example, you can run them before the whole test run or whole after test run. So usually in such cases, this would be like global cleanup or setting up your environment or setting up your database. So things you need to do for your whole run. So you can use uh, before test run and after test run hooks for that. Also, SpecFlow allows uh, to have a before feature and after feature hook. So these are some setups or steps you would like to do before a specific feature or after a specific feature. The same for a scenario. And uh, 
also spec flow allows even even more control and you can uh, even do some actions before every spec flow step and every and after every spec flow step so you may wonder what kind of actions we can do at this level but uh, believe me it can still be useful in practice so i will show you an example of hook uh, from our current project this is actually after step hook uh, so this executes after each spec flow test. And what we want to do in this case, we are wrapping a test failure. So let's say uh, the spec flow checks after each step if there are some exceptions. So for example, if there were, was an assertion exception and we want to catch it at this point and we want to provide additional details to this exception. So we do this uh, in such a way that uh, we catch this exception, we add some data to it. So for example, we uh, get the event logs and messages from database and attach it to original assertion exception. Why we did that instead of logging? Because we wanted to see immediately in the test output what was the problem and it was very helpful. So this is just an example of what you can do, but of course the imagination is your limit. So uh, you can do, uh, SpecFlow allows you to do a lot, a lot of different stuff. You just, um, it provides you a lot of tools and you, you can implement them in your in your own way uh i already see a question i know i uh, said i'll answer the end but uh yes it does support async uh so uh all spec flow actually steps uh and hooks they work both as a synchronous and both as synchronous flow uh and the spec the framework automatically awaits them so even if you define your hook or step as a sync and you don't await it explicitly in the code because it's called by the spectral framework it awaits the framework itself awaits it so yeah this this is to answer a question let's move on uh, another point i would like to discuss this is scenario or feature context so this is also provided by spec flow this is a mechanism to share data between uh, steps in a single scenario or a single feature so uh, this eliminates the need uh, to share, for example, global or constant variables be be between uh, your tests. And uh, this is best used for some simple data. So let's say in one step you create a user, but then you need to provide this user details to the next SpecFlow step. So then a SpecFlow allows you to use scenario or feature context. This is basically an object which you can access. And it has uh, different properties. For example, to access the current uh, context, you can just use current uh, property. You can also retrieve details uh, using scenario info properties such as title, uh, tags, which you test use or description. But probably the most valuable thing for you would be uh, this proper this methods add and try get value. This allows you to store and retrieve data and uh, within the single feature or scenario. So let's say you need to share some simple variables you can use that and it's provided out of the box but of course uh, it has its own limitations so uh, first i would like to say that if you need to share complex data or ob objects between steps i would recommend to create a custom object and inject it with a dependency injection frameworks or repository pattern or whatever so it is best used for share for sharing simple data or simple variables it's easy to use but if you want to use very complex data it becomes cumbersome uh, and the other thing uh, a best practice for scenario context is you should not propagate it deep into your code so only spec flow step definition classes or binding classes should know about it because you don't want again to introduce tight dependencies to spec flow and in the actual like deep logic of your code you want to be agnostic to what kind of um, what kind of framework you're using that's why you should only limit using scenario context uh, in actually spec flow steps and it will be it will make sure that uh, your framework is much more easily adjustable and you're not heavily dependent on on spec flow when you don't have to be in deep parts of your code and let's move on Another powerful thing which SpecFlow provides, this is called uh, step argument transformations. So what it does is, uh, we had some examples before when I've shown where, where we can provide text in our steps in the sense of variables, for example, product names or usernames or whatever. But uh, step argument transformations allows you to work not only with strings, but it can actually convert uh, the, the data you provide into complex types even, or it can perform uh, some kind of transformations on the values which you provide. Uh, 
It also simplifies step definitions because if you need some parsing logic to do, you don't want to repeat it in every step. You want to have it into one place. And this is what this allows to do. I'll show you an example in just a moment. And to use a step argument transformation, you apply a step argument transformation attribute to a method and it will convert either your parameter, which is a string or a table to a desired type. And then you can use this type into, into your step. So let, let me show you an example. So let's say we have a spec flow step where we want to provide you know, a register a user or provide user details. So we have a step given the user details. We have a name of the user, age and email. For example, this would be a complex type, not a simple one. So what we can do uh, to simplify our life, we can use step argument transformation and define it uh, in a separate class. And what will we do? It will take our table, which we provide, and it will create an user object, which we can then use in our step itself. So what this allows to do, you, you don't have to do any parsing logic inside the step itself. For example, uh, parsing the string, then creating a you, uh, depending on the provided values, creating a user. Specflow already will do that for you if you define a step argument transformation. And then when you want to use it, you just, you already operate on this transform type. So it is very useful, especially if you have some complex data, which you want to provide, especially as a table, I would highly recommend to always use step argument transformations and actually work on the object itself. Another common scenario, which I see in Specflow and which uh, it would be beneficial to discuss is how to handle dates in Specflow. Uh, I would also recommend actually not only dates, but relative dates. So a relative date would be something like today, yesterday, month ago, year ago. So sometimes you can use static dates. For example, you have defined date and you can just provide it as a date. It's fine. But if your business requires you to handle this relative time periods, then you should use step argument transformations and you should also avoid any kind of mathematical operations in your spec flow um, steps themselves. For example, you shouldn't say today minus one day or today minus year, whatever. Please remember that this is business focused language. So we don't have, want to have any math operations and uh, it also makes it harder to read and maintain in the future, but you should define your date periods according to your business requirements. So for example, let's say we have a requirement today. Uh, we can define like today uh, type yesterday, month ago, etc. So you should think again from a business perspective and try to define them in uh, terms which make sense and try to avoid kind of mathematical logic. And to give you an example, how we can do that. Um, so we have a case in our, let's say we have a case in our application that we have a um, return policy expiration period. Uh, so let's say it is 14 days. So after the customer buys something, he can only return it within 14 days. And if this period expires, then he, he doesn't want to return it. So a common mistake people would do you just say like when the order was completed today minus 14 days or whatever, uh, they introduce this mathematical operations and it becomes unclear. So what I would suggest uh, to do is to define it in a business language. So this means what 14 days means. It means that it's a return policy expiration period, right? So you can define this as a string. For example, you don't have to use such a long string. I just did it for readability. You can I use a shorter name, but basically you, it may, it needs to make sense from a business side. So in this case, I've named it after return policy period expired. Then we can use a step argument transformation for this. And this will transform the string actually in a C sharp date time, which is 14 days ago. And then when we actually, uh, use the step. So when the order was completed after return policy period expired, then we already know what kind of date we mean. So please notice uh, the benefits of such approach. First, like the technical details are hidden. So that the fact that it's today minus 14 days and the user sees uh, in, the, in the actual spec flow test, the business logic, which we need, uh, which we were trying to test. And this is, I think, the best approach which we can handle relative dates and make both your business people have happy. And another thing also, if you hard code uh, these dates, relative dates in your step, so let's imagine that requirements change and now it's not 14 days, but now it's three weeks. So if you just put it here as 14 days, uh, then the requirement changes and you have to go back to each spec flow test and adjust it. If you do it in the proper way, then it's only one place. 
we only have one definition you would change it just here and you would you wouldn't even touch spec flow test so i hope you can see the benefits of such approach both from readability perspective and also maintenance perspective another important point is it's actually recommended uh, by spec flow is to use a driver pattern for your steps so if you navigate to this link you can uh, see more details actually about the driver pattern provides more examples but i will provide examples as well in the current presentation so what this pattern allows to do is it separates um, it provides an additional layer between the step definitions and your automation code so this means that you don't have a lot of logic in your steps uh, in your step definition uh, you use drivers uh, and they're kind of driving your step and the most of the logic are uh, residing within the driver itself and this way uh, you can eat more, much more easily reuse steps you can combine them in different ways and they're much more readable because you don't there's not a lot of code in your step definition classes and it has even more benefits such as easier like adding new functionality which I will show in a moment but basically it allows you to reuse uh, the same driver methods across multiple step definitions or even different scenarios so i'll provide um, examples uh, in the next slide but i also forgot to mention that it's i also recommend going a step further and combining it combine it with a strategy strategy pattern uh, which is like a very common uh, how is it called uh, yes a very called common design pattern and it, it allow you to switch behaviors at the runtime uh, so if it's not clear at the moment bear with me i will explain every step but um, let's see the example so uh, this would be an example of a driver pattern with a sprinkle of strategy pattern so first before i dive into code uh, let's dis dis discuss our use case so uh, in our use case we have a user and the user can log into application using several different methods you know, for example apple id google authentication etc and we are tasked uh, to that we need to test this logic so what can we do to implement the driver pattern properly uh, so first we need to create a common login interface it will be our login driver so this would be uh, our driver and it would have a, a method common method login and then we're going to provide different implementations of for interface so let's say now we're supporting two kinds of authentication so we would want to implement a google authentication driver which implements the same interface and here provide a logic to log in using google uh, google id uh, then we need to create uh, for example an apple authentication driver again of the same interface and here we'll provide um, actual logic for logging in using, using apple id then of course we need to decide uh, when to pick the correct driver you can do it uh, many different ways but just for the sake of simplicity i've decided to use a simple very simple factory so depending on a login method which is provided we will either create a if it's a google authentication we're going to create a google authentication driver if it's apple authentication we're going to create an apple authentication driver and uh finally this is how our uh, step our driver will look like so this is our login steps driver this is actually driver pattern recommended by spec flow and here we provide our login method in our step and depending on the login method it will create it will provide us a correct login driver and call the correct uh, logic underneath so what this allows us to do if you see the actual step definition uh, we have uh, just one step definition when the user logs in uh, we have a parameter of a login method which we want to use and you notice that we don't have any logic within the step so this is the specflow specflow recommendation to use drivers which drive our steps and then depending on which kind of parameter we provide uh, we're gonna either log in using google authentication or we're gonna log in using apple authentication so what are the benefits of such approach so if you if you didn't realize it already first of all uh, our step definitions are very simple we have drivers which uh, drive our steps also uh, there's no duplication of step definitions as well which which we also can see is obvious but uh, the main also benefit why it's so important to use it is that uh, it allows for much easier extendability so let's say now we want to introduce facebook authentication so 
if you don't if you use driver pattern what you can do you don't need to change steps existing steps you don't even need to change uh, your step definition so spec flow part remains completely untouched you would only have to add another for example facebook authentication driver and add it to a factory and uh, and then the next time for example we want to log in using facebook the user will just you will just write a test when the user logs in using facebook authentication and if you provide it properly uh, the implementation and extend the factory that's all you have to do and the spec flow part remains completely untouched so it has a lot of benefits not only in readability and simplicity of code uh, you are much you can much easier extend your functionality and actually don't have to do any changes to your tests so I would recommend to use a driver pattern and also combine it with a strategy pattern if appropriate. For example, when you have different methods of doing the same thing, then you're using the best of both worlds, basically. And uh, to bring us, this brings us to our next point that spec flow is not hard to maintain uh, if you do it right. Uh, and remember what we discussed that a common complaint that spec flow tests are harder to maintain or that doesn't make any sense. Uh, Actually, I would bet that in 90 plus percent of those cases, uh, people are just not aware of the best practices such as driver pattern or test isolation, and they're doing it uh, how they're used to. And of course, if you don't know about this and you just start using SpecFlow as you used code before, you're going to run into problems. So to sum up, SpecFlow is not the problem in this case, it's actually you. So that's why it's so important to be aware of the best practices and how to use it properly. And if you're just going to bring the coding philosophy to SpecFlow, it's never going to work. So keep it in mind that it's not uh, SpecFlow, if done properly, is not hard to maintain. And from my own experience, I'm currently uh, two years in a project which, which heavily uses SpecFlow, even for backend testing. And comparing to previous projects which didn't, which didn't use SpecFlow, um, tests are much more easy to understand and read and maintain because you don't need to go through a lot of code to understand what tests are doing. So me personally, I'm, I'm just my own opinion. I'm not saying it's a fact, but in my opinion, it's the other way around. Co tests written in code are much harder to maintain and not the spec flow test. So, but again, you need to be aware how to properly use it. And the surprise bonus section, uh, I would just a few words I would like to mention about integrating your spec flow tests with Azure test plans. So if you are working with Azure, uh, there is a tool which is called SpecSync uh, and it allows you to easily synchronize your SpecFlow test cases with your Azure test plans. So uh, this is great for reporting, for example, or for like checking like releases and etc. So if you're using the Azure test plans, this is unfortunately a paid tool and it requires a license, but it works great and we're currently using it in our project. If you want uh, to report your automated test spec flow results to stakeholders, you can use it. And what it does, once you're going to run a pipeline uh, with spec flow tests, it's going to automatically update the statuses of your tests in your test plans and provide these reports. Uh, but if you're not using spec flow, uh, sorry, if you're not using Azure test plans or you're not using Azure at all, spec flow provides its own um, reporting tool, which is called spec flow living docs. This is basically an extension which allows you to display uh, your SpecFlow tests in a browser. And it functions again as a living and dynamically changing documentation. So here's the link for living docs. You can also find it easily in Google. But to give you an example of how it actually looks like. So uh, this is SpecFlow living docs example. And if you use it, basically once you run your tests, you have such a web report where you have all your features, all your steps. If you click on the feature, you can see the detailed steps, even uh, like what kind of steps passed, which, which not. And basically it's a way to provide a report for your stakeholders. So uh, there are different ways to do that, but SpecFlow also provides it for you. And to sum up, uh, today we discussed uh, behavior driven development in general when it's important to use it and uh, when it's uh, when it may not be the right fit for you so please remember to consider this criteria before you make your choice again remember that resistance to change or just complaining from developers or testers shouldn't be a strong argument i know people are reluctant to try new tools but you need to weigh in uh, different criteria to decide 
once you decide to use Spikeflow, it's important to be aware of the best practices uh, because if you don't, then it can really cause you a lot of problems. And also, I hope that by sharing uh, some of some of the advanced concepts in Spikeflow and providing you with examples, it will be helpful for you. So you don't have to repeat uh, the mistakes which a lot of people are repeating and it will bring you the best possible outcome for your project.